A Channel 4 editorial, how the governor selects judges. Here's WCCO-TV Vice President and General Manager Ron Hanberg. The woman in this picture is Joanne Smith. On November 10th, she'll become Judge Joanne Smith. Perhaps she'll turn out to be the finest judge ever to sit on the Ramsey County Municipal Bench. We wish her well. But we also wish Governor Perpich would change the system he's using to select judges. We agree with the governor that it's essential more women, blacks, and Hispanics be elevated to the bench. And we commend him for appointing persons other than white, middle-class males. But judges ought to be selected primarily for their legal ability and their community standing. In other words, on the basis of merit. Unfortunately, Joanne Smith appears to have been selected because one of her supporters has close ties to the governor. It's clear Smith was not even the best qualified woman seeking the job. Smith is only six years out of law school. Her experience is limited mostly to the public defender's office, where she is well respected. One of the other 30 applicants, Suzanne Flinch, has been a lawyer for 14 years, is chief prosecutor for the city of St. Paul, was formerly St. Paul city attorney, an assistant Ramsey County attorney, and a public defender. But Flinch wasn't even among the finalists, and therein lies the story. You see, when the Ramsey County vacancy occurred this summer, Perpich sought out the advice of Richard Sand, a St. Paul attorney. It happens that Sand and his mother, Tony Sand, worked in the Perpich election campaign. It also happens that Sand is married to the governor's cousin, Mary Dawn Brown. When Sand became a major force in picking a new judge, he favored Joanne Smith. Joanne Smith lives with Paula Ariana Cole. Ms. Cole is a law partner of Richard Sand. If all of this sounds a bit embarrassing, embarrassing to Joanne Smith, embarrassing to the governor, embarrassing to the taxpayers, then you get the point of this editorial. The system the governor uses to select judges seems unduly influenced by family ties and political cronyism. And that's as much an insult to the judges he appoints as it is to the public. Governor, we think the courts and the people deserve better than that. I'm Ron Hanberg. Ron Hanberg, speaking for the Channel 4 Editorial Board. We encourage replies to our editorials. Write Editorial 4, 11th on the Mall, Minneapolis 55403. The Channel 4 Editorial, the Anoka Police Stag Party. Here's WCCO-TV Vice President and General Manager Ron Hanberg. By now, almost all of us know the sordid story of the police stag party here in Anoka. Thirty leering, cheering, laughing cops, three topless prostitutes, assorted sex games, a good old time by the good old boys. Except this time they got caught, almost literally with their pants down. The Anoka police chief reacted quickly and angrily, firing three of his officers, suspending a half a dozen others without pay for up to a month. The Anoka undersheriff was as lenient as the police chief was harsh. He gave his deputies short suspensions and a fatherly lecture. The sheriff's men accepted the light discipline, but the Anoka police have appealed their punishment as being too harsh. Meantime, a secret grand jury has refused to bring criminal charges against anyone, possibly for lack of sufficient evidence, or simply because they felt the officers have suffered enough. While the full truth of this affair may never be known, the fact remains that reputations have been ruined, careers squandered, livelihoods lost. Certainly, this will be a dark memory for the city of Anoka. Whatever else happens in this case, it seems clear that the victims here were not so much the cops or even their families, but the community as a whole, and women in particular. Even the prostitutes who performed were victims, willing victims to be sure but victims of male attitudes that see women as objects of sexual pleasure, acceptable targets of sexual scorn. How can we expect other women who are victims of rape or incest to trust cops who see nothing wrong with demeaning females? The real tragedy of the Anoka Stag Party is that because of police insensitivity, there is a loss of respect for law and order. And when police wink or laugh at possible violations of the law, none of us is truly safe. I'm Ron Hanberg, and that's our view from Channel 4. We encourage replies to our editorials. Write Editorial 4, 11th on the Mall, Minneapolis 55403.
A Channel 4 editorial on organ transplants. Here's WCCO-TV Vice President and General Manager Ron Hanberg. Is there anything sadder than a sick child, especially one awaiting some form of organ transplant surgery? Thankfully, only one baby in 20,000 comes into this world needing a new liver to survive. But partly because liver transplants are so rare, they are incredibly expensive, costing upwards of $200,000 each. And money isn't the only worry. We've seen one desperate parent after another pleading for organ donors, burning into our memories names and faces like those of Jamie Fisk and Brandon Hall. In some cases, Americans have helped with fund drives and publicity, but often it is too little, too late. Children who could have lived have died. Children who could have been yours or mine. We think the time has come to change all of that. We believe now is the time for a coordinated national response to assist stricken families faced with these heartbreaking ordeals. Perhaps the best way to do this is to prove that these operations are safe and effective. We suggest that Washington designate a number of regional centers, such as the University of Minnesota, and provide research money for organ procurement and transplant surgery, selecting patients regardless of the family's ability to pay. House Bill 4080 will do these things and ban the private sale of human organs for profit. This legislation doesn't answer all of the questions, but it is a step in the right direction. If you feel as strongly as I do about helping youngsters like Jamie Fisk, write in support of House Bill 4080. I'll see that your letters get to Minnesota Congressman Jerry Sikorsky and Senator David Durenberger, who serve on committees in Washington dealing with these life and death issues. Together, maybe we can make a difference in the lives of some very sick children. I'm Ron Hanberg. We encourage replies to our editorials. Write Editorial 4, 11th on the Mall, Minneapolis 55403. Christmas editorial, here's Ron Hanberg. It's always nice in the warm glow of Christmas to wish upon a star, to dream the impossible dream of peace on earth, goodwill toward men, to sing joy to the world and to believe, if just for an instant, that all people everywhere might hear the words and join in the chorus. But in many parts of the world, of course, there is no peace and precious little goodwill. Places where there is no singing, just fighting and dying, where life itself is an impossible dream. Our wish upon the star this Christmas is that no child anywhere in the world will feel the pain or the terror of war, or the gnawing hurt of hunger, or the pangs of racial or religious intolerance, where a child can play as safely on the streets of Belfast or Beirut as they can on your street or mine, where visions of sugar plums are not transformed to nightmares shaped like mushroom clouds, where notions of love and decency are nurtured and cherished, where no child feels the sting of ridicule or abuse, where growing up as a girl is as full of promise and hope as growing up as a boy, where growing up as a black is as full of promise and hope as growing up as a white. We sure could use a little good news today. Like singer Ann Murray, our Christmas wish is for a little good news today. Where, as the lyrics say, nobody robbed a liquor store in the lower part of town. Nobody died, nobody burned a single building down. Nobody fired a shot in anger, nobody had to die in vain. And everybody loves everybody in the good old USA. We sure could use a little good news today. Merry Christmas, everyone. I'm Ron Hanberg. A Channel 4 editorial on controlling acid rain with Ron Hanberg. On the critical issue of acid rain, President Reagan has decided what's needed is more study, but little or no action. We think that's a serious mistake, one that Congress must take the initiative to correct. The problem originates with billowing smokestacks in heavily industrialized regions where coal-burning factories and power plants spew sulfur dioxide into the wind. In heavy freeway traffic, the pattern is repeated. 
Here the culprit is nitrogen oxide from car and truck exhaust. Flowing great distances both return to Earth as chemically polluted rainfall. Each drop 10 to 50 times more acidic than fresh, pure rain. Over time, the acid runoff in lakes and streams can kill fish and other aquatic life. Bass and walleye are especially vulnerable. Lakes in Minnesota's Boundary Waters canoe area are among the most likely to die. Already in eastern Canada and New England, more than 4,000 lakes are dead from acid rain. But so far, we have been spared. Not a single lake, tree, or field of crops in Minnesota has been lost, largely because our utilities have invested heavily in pollution controls. Still, we remain threatened by polluters hundreds of miles away. Two Minnesota congressmen, Representative Jerry Sikorsky and Senator Dave Durenberger, are leading the cleanup effort. We believe several features of their somewhat conflicting plans should be combined to get the best results. Congress should create an acid rain super fund to pay a major share of pollution control costs at the nation's dirtiest factories and power plants. The goal? To reduce the threat of acid rain by half within 10 years. The cost? Split 50-50 between a tax on the worst polluters and a surcharge on consumers' electric bills nationwide. That would mean about $6 a year to the average household. Utilities should have a free hand in deciding how to meet mandatory state-supervised emission standards. Scientists have proof that acid rain threatens the environment. Now we must demonstrate the resolve to keep our lakes alive. I'm Ron Hanberg in Washington. We encourage persons with opposing views to broadcast replies. Write Editorial 4, Minneapolis 55403. A Channel 4 editorial on school prayer with Ron Hanberg. Congress is once again struggling with the question of prayer in the public schools. Struggling indeed. The issue is so divisive that even the churches cannot agree. Several major denominations oppose a school prayer amendment, including Lutherans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists, and Jews. Too many in opposition to list them all. That evidence of religious diversity, we believe, is proof enough that Congress ought to forget about changing the Constitution and leave well enough alone. Let it be clearly understood, we are for prayer. We are for the free exercise of religion. We are for allowing school children to pray as they wish. That happens to be exactly what the Constitution permits as it is written now. Twenty years ago, the Supreme Court banned government-sponsored school Bible readings, banned pupils reciting government-written prayers, even though participation was voluntary. The court reasoned that no prayer could be truly voluntary if it was sanctioned by the state. But the ruling still allows students to pray or meditate in school. The worship simply cannot be organized by the government. Under guidelines approved by the State Board of Education, Minnesota schools cannot force students to read from the Bible as part of non-instructional activities but schools may use the Bible as a source book in teaching about religions. The same Minnesota guidelines prevent school officials from composing or authorizing prayers, yet it is clearly stated that a student has the right to pray at any appropriate time. We live in a society that's so varied that Catholics and Protestants can't agree on the wording of the Lord's Prayer, a society so careful to guard against religious persecution that the Constitution guarantees the right to pray yet prohibits government meddling with the churches. That's how it is. That's how it ought to be, period. I'm Ron Hanberg. We encourage broadcast replies. Write Editorial 4, Minneapolis 55403. Channel 4 editorial on the use of cameras in the courts with Ron Hanberg. 18-year-old Stephen Jenkins goes on trial this week for the murders of two bankers from Ruthton, Minnesota. Bankers allegedly lured to their deaths by Jenkins' father, who later committed suicide. You'll read about it in the newspapers, hear newscasters talk about it on radio and TV, but you won't be able to see or listen to the actual court proceedings. Cameras and microphones are banned. The ban was a split decision. The judge agreed to allow TV coverage. The prosecutor said okay, but the defendant's lawyer refused, even for opening statements or closing arguments where no witnesses are involved. News coverage will be limited, but you can bet the author of this book will have full access. Luigi DiFonzo has purchased the exclusive book rights to the Jenkins story. 
makes us wonder if the commercial interests of a murder defendant override the public's right to know. You see, in Minnesota trial courts, electronic news media can be excluded if any party to the case objects. We see that rule as a major flaw in what was supposed to be a two-year experiment for broadcast journalists. It hasn't been given much of a test. In the past year, we've asked to televise about a dozen trials. In virtually every case, someone has objected. As a result, the courtroom doors remain closed. Cameras were allowed in the recent Tislin murder trial at Alexandria, but cameras only, no sound, no radio. But afterward, everyone, including the judge, agreed the presence of cameras made no difference at all. The rules are much less restrictive in Massachusetts, where the recent gang rape trial was fully televised, and in Wisconsin and 18 other states where there's no need to get the party's consent. Only the judge decides. That's how it's been in Minnesota's appellate and Supreme Court for several years. There have been no problems. When citizens are called for jury duty, they see firsthand how our system of justice works. We think that's how it ought to be for all of the people all of the time. We think cameras ought to go where any citizen can go, with reasonable limitations, of course. The Supreme Court should drop the consent rule. Let us all see and hear from the jury's point of view. I'm Ron Hanberg. We encourage broadcast replies. Write editorial for Minneapolis 55403. For Judge Crane Winton, the long day's journey into night has finally come to an end. The months of uncertainty of what surely must have been personal and professional agony have passed. Like some kind of solitary figure from a Greek tragedy, the judge now stands alone, disgraced, disrobed, stripped of authority, a man who has fallen victim to his own weaknesses and desires. For the record, we agree with the Supreme Court that Crane Winton, the judge, is not fit for a position demanding the utmost respect. We have believed that since this sordid affair began. But that does not alter an overwhelming sense of sadness and sympathy for Crane Winton, the man. He was, by all accounts, a brilliant jurist, one whose knowledge of the law commanded great admiration. But he bore then as now a great burden as well. He is a homosexual, and his defense centered on the question, in Minnesota, can a homosexual be a judge? Now the Supreme Court has said that homosexuality is not the point at all. Instead, Witten must leave the bench mostly because he sought out and exploited vulnerable young people, openly soliciting 15 to 20 male prostitutes the past several years. He violated laws he had sworn to uphold, even lied under oath. In a sense, the Supreme Court had no choice but to remove Witten from the bench. For how can the public expect justice from a system that does not hold those who sit in judgment to the highest standards of personal conduct? It is a harsh decision, reflecting the considerable demands we place on our public servants, demands that have claimed Crane Winton the judge. We wish Crane Winton the man peace with himself. I'm Ron Hanberg. A Channel 4 editorial on boating and drinking with Ron Henberg. Drinking and driving don't mix any more in our lakes and rivers than they do on our highways. Alcohol is thought to be the number one cause of boating fatalities. But the penalties for driving are less for boaters than for motorists. We believe Minnesota must extend its battle against drunks to the waterways and better enforce the safety laws already on the books. Sheriff's officers spent much of this past week dragging Lake Minnetonka. They were looking for the bodies of two members of a wedding party killed in a nighttime boating collision. There's no indication that the operator of either boat was drunk. But the sheriff says both drivers were given alcohol tests and that all of the adults in both boats had been drinking. So far this year, 12 persons have died in Minnesota boating accidents. Last year, more than 100 accidents claimed a total of 24 lives fully one-third of them alcohol-related. Sometimes, especially on weekends, the overcrowding, the speeding, the drinking, the recklessness are enough to scare anyone into staying on shore. Safety is definitely out of fashion. It seems no one wears a life jacket, and many don't have enough life preservers in case there is an emergency. 
The drunks don't run much risk of being caught. Unlike Canada, Minnesota has no open bottle law, so it's legal to drink and drive. The sheriff's water patrol, often staffed by specially deputized volunteers, is hopelessly outnumbered. Boaters can be arrested for driving while intoxicated, but they can't be forced to take an alcohol test. Without such evidence, convictions are out of the question. It's time we crack down. Minnesota should have an implied consent law for boaters. It should be a crime to refuse an alcohol test, and there should be stronger enforcement of all water safety regulations. Minnesota has more boats per person than any state in the nation. We should have the toughest drunk driving laws for boaters as well. I'm Ron Hanberg. We encourage broadcast replies. Channel 4 Christmas Editorial with Ron Hanberg. As we all look back on 1984, each of us has our own images of the past year etched in our memories. Moments frozen in time like snapshots have come to represent what this year has been. Some of those images are unforgettable. It's two vaults, remember? Oh, boy. Who can forget Mary Lou Retton and the other triumphant young American athletes at the Olympics? Their gold medal performances personifying what seems to be a new spirit awakening in this country. Or the Olympic crowds chanting, USA, USA, with a patriotism that was electrifying to many, troubling to some in its fervor. And who can forget in this land of plenty, the pitiful faces and the shrunken bodies of the starving thousands in Ethiopia. Our hearts go out further than our hands can reach, and we are left with a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. 1984 has also been a year of irony. While the world fretted about the specter of nuclear war and fallout, a poison gas few of us had ever heard of quickly and silently wiped out more than 2,000 innocent people in India. It has been a year of triumph for some, stunning defeat for others. It has been a year of more senseless and brutal terrorism and of assassination, another world leader among the victims. When George Orwell wrote the book 1984, the year seemed so distant that many thought it would never come. Well, it has come, and now almost gone, and we have survived it. Not without pain and suffering and terror and tension, but with the world still intact. Our wish for this Christmas and this new year is that food will fill the stomachs of the starving, that peace will fill the hearts of the hate mongers, and that wisdom will fill the minds of the leaders of this troubled world. I'm Ron Hanberg. The Channel 4 editorial on the flap over a school dress code with Ron Hanberg. It's good to see cooler heads prevail after all the fuss about a student dress code here at Susan B. Anthony Junior High. It was only a few weeks ago that 7th and 8th graders were spilling into the streets, protesting a ban on punk-style clothing and hairdos. The police were called. There were arrests. Several youngsters were suspended from school. Now the principal, teachers, parents, and students are talking. The ultimatum that triggered the hard feelings has been withdrawn, and the energies that spawned the near riot are again focused on the classroom and the job of getting a decent education. There is a lesson in all of this, one we think the adults in charge here should have learned a long time ago, that our young people deserve a generous dose of trust, respect, and understanding in these formative years. Too often we see adolescents as just punks or preppies, mohawks or flat tops, forgetting that each is an individual trying to decide where he or she fits into the scheme of things. Most parents realize that loud music, gaudy dress, or fairly outrageous behavior are nothing to get excited about, that the best way to deal with the challenge teenagers present is to approach them more like equals, more like the grown-ups they want to be. 
Even if they sometimes seem childish, teens desperately want more independence, more responsibility, a greater say in running their own lives. As supposedly mature adults, we need to allow them the freedom, space, and support to grow, or admit that we have forgotten what being a teenager is all about. I'm Ron Hanberg. We offer equal time for an opposing view. A Channel 4 editorial on drinking and boating with Ron Hanberg. We think the 1985 legislature made a fatal mistake in failing to crack down on drunk boaters. Fatal because without fear of prosecution, irresponsible boaters will continue to maim and kill on our crowded waterways. It's an issue crying to be heard again. The lawmakers appear to value money over life and limb. Some voted against safe boating reforms out of fear that tougher laws would scare away tourists and hurt the state's economy. Molly George doesn't see it that way. It's careless boaters who scare her to death, and with good reason. A few summers ago, she was run over and nearly cut to ribbons by a careless driver in a high-powered motorboat. Molly and a friend's son were in a paddle boat close to the lakeshore. We took off from the dock, and very shortly after we left the dock, we saw a large speedboat bearing down on us. We were hit off the side of his bow and it flipped our boat up in the air and both of us with it. And then as I was thrown in the water, this man had to turn very quickly to avoid hitting my dad's dock. And at that point in time, I was caught in the props of his motor. And that's what nearly killed me. The boy suffered a spinal injury, but he was protected by a life vest. Molly wasn't so lucky. The propeller blades cut deeply into her arm and back. The deepest point, it was all the way down to the back side of my lung. And, but fortunately, it missed my heart and my aorta. And, my, and as I was told in the hospital, I missed becoming a quadriplegic by a sixteenth of an inch. After the accident, a witness thought she saw parties in the motorboat tossing cans and bottles overboard. But the operator was never tested for alcohol. And there's the dilemma. On the highway, a suspected drunk breaks the implied consent law simply by refusing a test for intoxication. On the water, a suspect can refuse a breath or blood test with little fear of consequences. That just doesn't make any sense. Drunks are as much a hazard one place as the other. The same tests and the same stiff penalties ought to apply for the operators of cars and boats alike. I'm Ron Hanberg. We offer equal time for an opposing view. A Channel 4 Holiday Editorial with Ron Hanberg. Each year about now, we try to pause for a moment in the glow and warmth of this holiday season to reflect on the year past and to wonder and wish about the year ahead. Each year, somehow, it seems harder to shake the horrors of the headlines that have haunted the front pages on our television screens. The earthquakes in Mexico, the mudslides in Colombia, the starvation in Africa, the oppression in South Africa, the hijackings, the hurricanes, the disasters on the ground and in the air. It was all there again in 1985. But you know, there is a difference this year. There amidst all of the human suffering is a ray or two of hope. Who can forget the sight of Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev smiling and shaking hands in the sunshine of Geneva, actually talking to one another about reducing arms and reducing tension overcoming for a few hours at least the obstacles of language and upbringing and ideology to talk about peace. And who can forget the sight of that Minnesota boy and that Moscow girl touching hands electronically, using a space satellite to bridge the continents and the oceans and the Iron Curtain to sing and talk of a future without fear. Those are the images of 1985 we want to remember. And our wish for this new year is that the hope and the love we see in the eyes of these children will somehow penetrate the walls of the White House and the Kremlin. To hasten the time, there truly will be peace on Earth. I'm Ron Hanberg, wishing you all a very happy new year. Thank <laughs> you.
present a Channel 4 editorial on gopher basketball and sexual assault with Ron Hanberg. As the basketball gophers resume their interrupted season, University President Ken Keller finds himself in an ideal position. He can, and we think he should, make Minnesota the pace setter, demanding higher standards in Big Ten athletics. We're convinced this is the time for sweeping changes throughout the conference, perhaps the nation, to ensure a higher caliber of student athlete. Keller certainly has his priorities in the right order. Priorities set in the wake of the sexual assault charges against three Gopher basketball players. His first priority, the rape victim. Assuming the allegations are true, her life may be ruined. Second priority, the university's reputation. And with all the national publicity about this shameful disgrace, he has good reason to be concerned about that. Another priority, eliminating athletes whose disregard for moral values proved them unworthy of representing the university. And here, too, we agree. Unless the rape charges turn out to be false, and regardless of whether they result in convictions, Keller should order that none of the accused players ever wear gopher uniforms again. We think Keller and the Big Ten should be guided by two basic principles. First, that universities are academic institutions, not athletic factories. And second, that it's better to prevent problems than deal with them after the fact, especially with regard to sexual assault. It's fine to provide counseling for victims of rape, but the heart of the matter is protecting women from sexual opportunists, and that requires raising the moral sensitivities of the entire university community and of the men's athletic department most of all. As sports fans, we want winning teams, but with intelligent, mature athletes, not with pampered superstars who think they can have anything they want. I'm Ron Hanberg. We offer equal time for an opposing view. The Channel 4 editorial on the Hormel strike with Ron Hanberg. How can you tell when a strike isn't working? A strike like the one at the Hormel plant in Austin. You can tell it isn't working when the governor sends in the National Guard and the public doesn't even get upset when union leaders are cited for contempt of court, when striking employees talk about lying in the street and risking mass arrest, when loyal union members cross the picket line, when you haven't seen a real paycheck in 24 weeks, when brother is pitted against brother, father against son, when the international union and the local can't agree on tactics, when the local refuses to vote on a mediated settlement, when if they had, it would have been the third vote on the same proposal, when even the AFL-CIO doesn't have much to say about what's going on. You can also tell when a company's labor relations aren't working, when your workforce has been off the job five and a half months, when you have to hire 450 replacements, when police need military troops to keep the plant in operation, when roving pickets try to disrupt your business in other states, when your own employees mount a national boycott of your products, when your customers find razor blades in their hot dogs, when some guy in a TV editorial is listing your problems and it sounds as if he could go on forever. Well, this strike can't last forever, but it could become ever more bitter and destructive for everyone involved. In our view, the company clearly has gained the upper hand. Now we think Hormel, dealing from a position of strength, can afford to be conciliatory, make a gesture local P9 won't be able to ignore, and which in turn will inspire the union to make concessions of its own. How can you tell if a strike is ending? Only when both sides are willing to back down. I'm Ron Hanberg. We offer equal time for an opposing view. A Channel 4 editorial on the Nicollet Mall with Ron Hanberg. The Nicollet Mall, at its very best, is colorful, vibrant, alive, pulsing with people-pleasing activities, lending a sense of fun and excitement, producing smiles, lifting spirits, sparking our imaginations. But there are days and weeks when it's very, very quiet, when there's virtually nothing going on. We'd like to see more of these bustling crowds, more of the delightful features that attract them, 
Sidewalk cafes, strolling musicians, ice cream vendors, artists, craftspeople, dancing waters, interesting faces everywhere. More of a continual festival atmosphere to charm both our visitors and those of us who live, work, and shop year-round in the midst of this energy-charged environment. There's plenty going on already. Block parties, the farmer's market, aquatennial events, the music of Somerfest. But wouldn't it be terrific if we could pick up the pace and keep it busy like that every day? The mall is a very special place, and it's run in a very special way, maintained out of a million-dollar fund financed by assessments on downtown merchants, but ultimately controlled by the public through the Minneapolis City Council. It is a system that works, but one that has the capacity for handling so much more, without the need for another nickel's worth of public expense. From now through November, community leaders will be pondering the future of the Nicollet Mall, how it might be rebuilt, whether buses should be allowed or maybe run underground, whether to keep it open to the sky or enclosed and covered by a dome. But the essence of this place isn't concrete and steel. It's people, people drawn by crowd-pleasing activities, people and excitement. The planners ought to remember that that's what big city life is really all about. I'm Ron Hanberg. We offer equal time for an opposing view. The Channel 4 editorial on our choice for Hennepin County Attorney with Ron Henberg. The government center in Minneapolis, home of one of the area's biggest law firms, the Publix Law Firm, with 95 practicing attorneys and the leadership up for grabs. We're speaking, of course, about the Hennepin County Attorney's Office, with incumbent Tom Johnson and challenger Tom Heffelfinger locked in a rough-and-tumble election campaign, each claiming he'd be the better public servant. Heffelfinger claims to be best because he's an experienced trial lawyer who'd be tougher on plea bargaining while holding higher ethical standards. Tom Johnson admits he doesn't personally try criminal cases. He says he has dozens of assistant prosecutors for that that his job is basically administrative, he makes policy and sees that it's carried out. Heffelfinger says he'd try only one or two small cases a year just to set an example. We don't think it makes any difference. Then there's plea bargaining, cutting deals with criminal defendants. Tom Johnson relies on plea bargaining to clear eight cases in ten. We're satisfied that the thousand case court backlog demands it. Johnson uses sound bargaining standards based on the state sentencing guidelines. In fact, Heffelfinger says he'd use the same standards himself. But Heffelfinger, who has police federation and other law enforcement backing, claims Johnson is soft on serious offenders. A computer analysis suggests Heffelfinger is wrong. Johnson's as tough on crime as the prosecutors in St. Paul and six other larger counties. No legal ground. There are other issues as well including public defender right now, Bill Kennedy's well-publicized charges against Johnson over the arrest of fathers who allegedly kidnapped their own children. Heffelfinger has pounced on the issue, but we think it's without merit. We rarely endorse candidates for public office, but the confusion in this race seems to demand it. We see no need for change. We think Tom Johnson is a good prosecutor, tough but fair, and deserving of another term as county attorney. I'm Ron Hanberg. We endorse Tom Johnson for Hennepin County Attorney. A Channel 4 editorial on government censorship with Ron Hanberg. There's no time to do a formal survey, but I suspect only one or two people out of ten in our television audience are concerned, much less outraged, that the FBI confiscated the cameras and the film and tape of Minneapolis Star and Tribune and WCCO television photographers, or that the United States Attorney demanded to personally and officially supervise the video editing of the story for our 10 p.m. news. The media doesn't get a lot of sympathy these days, especially when their antagonists are feds involved in the war on drugs. Well, we think you ought to be concerned, that you ought to feel the same outrage we feel, because your freedoms, as well as ours, are at stake. It happened during a routine drug bust in North Minneapolis. There was nothing secret about the operation. The photographers had every right to be there. No one argues that. But the police wanted them to leave, rather than to explain why 
an FBI agent just said to our photographer, give up your camera or you're going to jail. The FBI was worried that some undercover agents would be shown on TV or in the newspapers, that they'd be identified and that their lives or other investigations might be endangered. Those are legitimate concerns, concerns we share and over the years have respected. Never to our knowledge have we revealed the identity of an undercover agent. And we would have honored that pledge in this case too. But voluntarily protecting undercover agents is one thing. It's something else to have the FBI seize your camera and tapes, to have government agents in the newsroom making sure the 10 p.m. news is edited to their satisfaction. Those are strong arm tactics, police state censorship. And we want the FBI and the U.S. attorney to assure us in writing that they know it's wrong and that it will never happen again. That's the least you and we should expect. I'm Ron Hanberg. We offer equal time for an opposing view. A Channel 4 editorial on English as the official language with Ron Hanberg. Over at the Capitol, they're talking about a law to make English Minnesota's official state language. Most people are surprised that it isn't already, but it's not. And we can't think of a very good reason why it ought to be. Mostly because we don't see any problem with things as they are, with English not being required by statute. But also because other languages add so much to our diverse ethnic and cultural heritage. The proposed law has to be one of the shortest on record. It just says, quote, be it enacted, English is the official language of the state of Minnesota. No further explanation, leaving lots of room for interpretation. Some might argue we'd have to change the name of the state because strictly speaking, Minnesota isn't English. It comes from two Dakota Indian words, roughly translated to mean sky-colored waters. Only common usage and no doubt another law makes the Native American part of English terminology. And if that changes, then what about other Dakota names for lakes and places? Minnehaha, Wasika, Winona, Mendota, Minnetonka, and Mankato. Not to mention the Ojibwe, Chisago, Pokegama, Bemidji, and Winnebagoshish. Or the state's motto, La Trois du Nord, which in French is Star of the North. And if that goes, then what about Nicolet and La Salle, La Sour, Duluth, and Mille Lacs? We're stretching the point, of course, but the point is that rather than erect barriers denying the rich contribution of other tongues, then German and Scandinavian, now Asian and Hispanic, we ought to celebrate our growing international character. We talk a lot about Minnesota being a center for world trade, about being world class in so many ways. Well, what could be more world class than appreciating the new immigrants and seeing their native languages not as a threat, but as a compliment to our way of life? and to the English language as well. I'm Ron Hanberg. We offer equal time for an opposing view. A Channel 4 editorial on the I-Team and Northwest Airlines with Ron Hanberg. Some people think WCCO-TV's I-Team is unfairly picking on Northwest Airlines. One such person is Northwest Director of Media Relations, Red Tyler. The other day, Tyler told a group of journalists that Northwest is a surprisingly good community resident. But that instead of telling that side of the story, the media has been beating up on Northwest the last couple of years. What's being overlooked? Tyler says Northwest gives the better part of a million dollars each year to charity, that the families of the airline's 13,400 employees are about equal to the population of Rochester, and that their payroll represents as much buying power as the city of Duluth. So why the bad press? Tyler says it's because the media here are just different than in other parts of the country. For instance, he says Atlanta is very, very loyal to Delta Airlines, which is headquartered there that in fact there's a tremendous amount of loyalty in the South to local companies, but very little here. Well, to set the record straight, we have nothing against Northwest's employees, no bias against Northwest Airlines itself. 
And we don't think informing the public that some of Northwest planes have flown for weeks or months with broken parts is either disloyal or unneighborly. A journalist's role isn't to curry favor or to be a hometown booster, but to tell it like it is. In this case, both the FAA and Minnesota Congressman James Oberstar are voicing similar concerns, that the evidence suggests a deteriorating margin of safety at Northwest. If we, Congress, and the FAA can spur action that might save even one life, then we'll have done Northwest and the traveling public a far greater service than if we'd been loyal and silent about their troubles. I'm Ron Hanberg. We offer equal time for an opposing view. A Channel 4 end-of-the-year editorial with Ron Henberg. Until a couple of weeks ago, 1987 seemed like a pretty drab year to me. Maybe it's creeping middle age or a creeping cynicism, but there seemed to be more than the normal run of wars and crime, more than the usual example of man's greed, of his insensitivity and inhumanity to his fellow man. Nothing very uplifting or encouraging about 1987. Then a couple of small but miraculous things happened that made it all seem better somehow. First, there was the incredible story of the young Fargo boy who was plucked from the bottom of an ice-covered river after 45 minutes under the frigid water. Who will ever forget this scene? But more importantly, who will ever forget the medical miracle that followed? Within days, the boy was up and around. Within weeks, he was on his way home, just in time for Christmas with his family. And what better gift could they or we have received? And then there was the story of all the other gifts that almost didn't make it into the hands of children. The story of how this community responded to a frantic plea for help. Santa Anonymous in desperate need of thousands of gifts for needy kids with precious little time to collect them before Christmas. People of all ages responding in hours, many in the dead of night, delivering their arms loads or sacks full of gifts more than 20,000 presents in less than 24 hours, filling the need, filling the hearts of children. And for each of these stories, there are probably a hundred or a thousand more. Stories of humanity, not inhumanity. Stories of giving, not greed. Stories of life, not death. May 1988 end as well as 1987. I'm Ron Hanberg, wishing you all a very happy new year. A Channel 4 editorial on the flap over the evening news with Ron Hanberg. It's been a few days now since Dan Rather and Vice President George Bush went toe-to-toe -to -toe during an interview on the CBS Evening News. Long enough that our phones have stopped ringing with reactions and we can draw some conclusions of our own about who may have won or lost in the confrontation. There's plenty of reason, I suppose, for us to side with Dan Rather. After all, we are a CBS affiliate. He's on Channel 4 every weeknight and WCCO television has a proud tradition of aggressive news coverage. But the truth is, we're disappointed. Instead of winners, all we find here are losers. Dan Rather lost, George Bush lost, and worst of all, you, the viewer, lost. In our opinion, Rather and Bush both were unprofessional and irresponsible. Neither was doing his job very well. A TV anchorman is supposed to deliver the news. His entire career is based on believability the extent to which he's earned the public's trust. By appearing to badger the vice president, Dan Rather tarnished his own reputation. One of Dan's favorite lines when speaking to other journalists is not to be a lap dog, not to be an attack dog, but only to be a watchdog. This time, he ignored his own best advice. On the other hand, someone seeking the office of president of the United States has a rock solid obligation to be square, honest, and forthright with the American people to answer the hard questions fully and without hesitation in order to earn our votes at the ballot box. On the Iran-Contra issue, so far as his personal involvement is concerned, the vice president continues to be evasive. He'd divert our attention to the foibles of the news media instead of simply telling us what part he played in the arms for hostage deal, letting the public judge his actions for better or for worse. 
No, we're sorry to say neither the candidate nor the anchor man has served us very well. They lost, and those of us who just tuned in to get the news lost too. I'm Ron Hamburg. We offer equal time for an opposing view. The Channel 4 editorial on crime prevention with Ron Hanberg. I think it's fair to say that all of us are sick of crime, of the rising numbers of robberies and rapes and murders, of drugs and drug killings. Our first reaction, our first instinct, is to get tough with the bad guys, put them behind bars and keep them there. Well, there are plenty of get tough on crime bills now winding their way through the Minnesota legislature. And guess what? If just three of the toughest pass, we'll have to build and operate three or four new state prisons over the next 10 years. That's a cost of about 200 million in taxpayer dollars over a single decade. And even that probably won't be enough. But more importantly, the extra prisons probably won't do that much good. It's been said before, but we'll say it again. How much better to spend those dollars trying to solve the problem instead of putting it behind prison walls, out of sight, out of mind. Nine out of 10 of today's prisoners were victims of some kind of abuse growing up, physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. 70% of the crimes they committed were drug related. How much better to spend that 200 million, not only on bricks and bars, but also on programs that are likely to prevent people from becoming felons in the first place. Education, child protection, job training, chemical awareness, programs that might mean 10 years from now we won't have to spend another 200 million or so on even more prison cells. You know, among the industrialized nations of the world, the United States has the highest rate of incarceration except for two countries, South Africa and the Soviet Union. We think that's pitiful. And we hope the legislature understands that while it's fine to get tough on the criminals of today, we ought to be doing all we can trying to prevent the criminals of tomorrow. I'm Ron Hanberg. We offer equal time for an opposing view. The Channel 4 editorial on the death of Richard Green with Ron Henry. I didn't know Richard Green very well. I wish I had known him better. I envy those who did, who were touched more directly by his life, his fiery ambition, his feistiness, his enthusiasm, his ideas, his willingness to take on anything or anybody who stood in the way of kids getting a better education, especially kids growing up as he did, black and poor, without a lot of opportunity, when there was always a better chance of going wrong than right. It's always sad when someone dies young. It's especially sad when that someone is as rare and special as Richard Green was, someone whose potential to help solve some of the most perplexing problems of our times is cut short, his work left unfinished. We'll never know what Richard Green could have accomplished in the rest of a normal lifetime, whether he could have made the New York schools truly better, whether what he did accomplish there and in the Minneapolis schools will be truly lasting. But we do know he tried with all of his heart and all of his mind and energy, and you can't ask more of anyone. I wish I had known Richard Green better. I'm Ron Hanberg. Channel 4 editorial on Commissioner Nichols' phone calls with Ron Hanberg. You could almost hear the yawns out there last week when Channel 4 reporter Pat Kessler did a couple of stories on State Agriculture Commissioner Jim Nichols about the 200 or so phone calls Nichols and his staff made to the Dukakis for President campaign, calls made from state offices on state time at state expense. Nichols has been an enthusiastic supporter of Dukakis, has been mentioned in fact as a possible Secretary of Agriculture in a Dukakis administration. Nichols denies the calls were political, says they dealt with farm policy questions. After all, he says, when someone calls you, you have to call them back. That's just common courtesy. But he says to avoid any appearance of political activity, he'll pay for the phone calls out of his own pocket. Doesn't want to be tried in the media, he says. Well, Commissioner, that's mighty generous of you, but we think you owe us more than that. True, it's not such a big deal, just 200 bucks or so in phone calls. Certainly there's no outcry from the Capitol or anywhere else for that matter. 
Maybe it's just another sad fact of political life, something we've all come to expect and accept. Who cares? Ho-hum. Well, we care, and we think you ought to care, too. We elect governors to appoint commissioners who will devote all of their time to state business, not to spend their days on the phone dishing out free advice to political candidates, especially their favorite political candidates. No, Commissioner, you owe us more than just a paid-up phone bill. You owe us an apology. I'm Ron Hanberg. We offer equal time for an opposing view.